Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cloud Wars Live, where we explore today's digital revolution by speaking with business executives and thought leaders who are changing how the world lives, works, plays, learns, and dreams. Our guest today is Wayne Saden, star of our monthly Saden on Digital series. Wayne has been a CIO, a CTO, a CDO, and currently advises CEOs and boards around the world on business strategy, digital strategy, and more likely these days, digital business strategy. Wayne, welcome back. Always a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Bob. It's always great to be here, and I look forward to our conversations. Wayne, thanks. So um, I know among the topics you wanted to talk about here was some of the problems they had over at Capital One, and you raised some interesting issues around that because understandably, a lot of executives are going to be concerned about this and wondering, could this happen to me? Might it happen to me? How do I make sure it doesn't happen to me? So Wayne, walk us through that. What do you see going on there? Well, let's break it down into two parts to that question. Can it happen to me is one question. And the other one is, is it Amazon's fault, AWS's fault, or is it Capital One's fault? Because the press is full of the cloud is bad, AWS is at fault, poor Capital One. So let's answer the question, can it happen to me? first? The answer is, it can always happen to you. Whether your data center is a server under your desk in a small business, or you're at a multinational company. Hackers never sleep. Hackers are always upgrading their technology and sharpening their tools. And it behooves all of us at the board level, C-suite level, to be understanding the risk we're assuming by being part of the cyber world. So the first part is it can always happen to you. The second part is did being in the cloud inherently make them insecure? And so the answer to that in general is no, the cloud is very secure. But let's dig in a little bit deeper to what happened between Amazon and Capital One. So without getting into technical details, a former Amazon employee, which at this point seems irrelevant but may not be, was able to use what's known as a well-known feature. So Amazon has these addresses you can send a request to. Hey, I need a question answered. Tell me the answer. And because Capital One misconfigured their firewall, a firewall being the service, the software, hardware that protects their network, the, uh, the evildoer was able to say, give me this information. And the firewall said, sure. And then using one piece of information to get another to get another, the person was able to walk the security chain and ultimately dump customer data. Now, is that Amazon's fault? People in the press are saying, well, Amazon had this well-known vulnerability, this well-known address in their system that you could ask questions of. So I'm going to put it in completely different terms because we can talk technical stuff all day. Let's say you rented a, a warehouse and it's got a fence around it. Your business, I got a warehouse. I got a fence around it. See the fence? I rented a building with a fence. And let's say the vendor says there's an easement in the back of the fence. And so I run power lines through it for the power company. So you know that it's an easement. It's a well-known hole in the fence. And let's say you're driving trucks through that. You're driving trucks around. The easement is so narrow, you can't get a truck through it. You're perfectly safe. But a human being can walk through the hole. So if you bought this, lease this property with a fence around it with an easement, and somebody walks through the easement and opens your unlocked warehouse door and steals all your stuff, is the person who rented you the warehouse liable? It's a well-known hole in my fence. Well, the answer is, if you're protecting against trucks, it was a great solution. If you're protecting against people, you needed to pay attention. So the real answer is, Amazon has well-documented ways into the system. It's not their fault. You are buying from them what's known as infrastructure as a service, IAAS, which says, we're going to sell you raw capacity. I'm going to sell you this warehouse with a fence around it. And then it's up to you to figure out what security you want. So to give you an example, if I knew I had to protect as the warehouse um, lessee, my space from people breaking in and stealing my stuff, I might put cameras up. I might put a guard. I might even lock the door. And so these are things one does to protect the property when you're, that you're leasing the ground in the building from somebody else. So, if you're a security person or a cryptographer or all the security experts, they're cringing at my example, I'm sure, because it's not exactly an easement and it's not exactly people walking through. But it's the same thing. 
The question is, do you and should you, as the person renting the property, understand two things? What are you trying to protect? And what are you being given that you've got to add to to make the security good enough for you? And that's how I look at Amazon versus Capital One. So when, I, I guess part of what you're saying there, in some cases, it's a variation or a version of the old buyer beware notion, right? And we, we've seen this so often that uh, certainly the tech companies have a lot at stake here and they have a lot of responsibility in this. But there have been so many instances where the business customer that has, is using certain technology hasn't kept up, kept up with the patches, hasn't kept the, its end of the hygiene equation mm -hmm. sort of up to snuff. And is there any parallel here with that? Is that part of what you're saying? Well, yeah, you know, we've talked about hygiene before, and it's a notion that is very important in cybersecurity. And for people that haven't seen the earlier installments, hygiene just says keeping stuff spruced up. It's the, the analogy is keeping the place painted and making sure the hinges are oiled in your door, keep it, doing the maintenance in your chemical plant. In cybersecurity, it means making sure you've got the vulnerabilities that are well-known and already discovered, patched and secured. So if Microsoft or Salesforce or whoever sends you a patch, put it on. Don't wait six months, don't wait a year. And that means you've got to be ready to do this work in the cadence that needs to be done. So, so hygiene is an element. And what actually happened, as, as is reported in, in Capital One, is they should have turned off a whole bunch of features. When you go ask the question of this Amazon service, tell me some information, what you should be doing is saying, only tell me this answer. There's a name for that too in security, and it's becoming very trendy and it's very important. It's called zero trust security. Microsoft has a different name, conditional access, but it's the same thing. It says, the only answer I should give is based on who the questioner is and where they're asking the question from and why. So the way a traditional firewall works is if I'm here and you're there, the firewall says send a message between them. We're only looking at where you are. I'm a laptop computer and you're my server, it's okay. But conditional access or zero trust says a firewall should never be able to ask the customer data to tell it about itself. The firewall is only there to protect the security. Why would a firewall ever want to know where the customer data is? So you would set up a rule that says, who can ask for customer data? Only customer service people, only the legal department, only the people who deal with it in marketing. And so by setting up a zero trust environment, which is hard hygiene, you can say, this is the only data flow that's allowed based on what you're asking. So another way to do it, is to say, I can scan the whole network looking for things like social security numbers, looking for well-formed strings of text. And then I can say, if a document looks like it has a social security number in it, I'm going to restrict it. Maybe I'm restricting too much, but we can unrestrict it later. Better that than have somebody purloin millions of documents out because the person creating the document didn't realize that some random other person could access them. And that clearly falls within the heading of hygiene. Yeah. So when next week you go in and you're going to be giving some advice to a, a publicly traded financial services company to the board of directors and they sit down and in front of everybody's seat around the table, there's a copy of this story about what happened at Capital One. And they say to you, Wayne, you told us the cloud is a secure environment. What happened here? Should we be afraid of the cloud? And nobody should be afraid of the cloud any more you're afraid of the data center you built, any more you're afraid of the co-location center. Um, one of the things I say to clients all the time is you can outsource your hardware, and you can outsource your software, and you can outsource your process, but don't outsource your brains. Don't say the cloud is the answer to my problem. It's not panacea. It's not magic. I once heard Larry Ellison at a, a Oracle customer forum at Open World say, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, it's not a cloud. There's really a server there somewhere. And that sound, that's, you know, Ellison at his best, but um, it was kind of funny sounding originally. But then I thought, you know, for the people who think the cloud is magic, that's a real wake-up call. And so if you're the board or the CEO, recognize that moving to the cloud doesn't mean I get to fire my cybersecurity team. It doesn't mean I get to fire my CIO and replace them with an order taker. 
you still got to be managing the assets of the company actively to protect the company from the risks and also to seize the opportunities. Um, so I think that's very, very important if I was advising these companies. First of all, I worked in financial services for almost 30 years. They have a very sophisticated security program, not just cyber. They worry about the physical security of the buildings, the physical security of the money. So security is baked in and risk management is baked into the banking system. And so that shouldn't change because you're in the cloud. It should all be part and parcel of how you do your business. So we've got a situation with Capital One that's a little bit unique. If, if I was going to advise a company with their kind of cybersecurity and IT budget, the answer is you can spend whatever it takes to secure yourself from big bad Amazon tricking you. Now, if you're a ma and pa grocery store moving to the cloud, the story might be different. And so there are different flavors of the cloud, and I should spend a minute on that, Bob. When you're buying infrastructure as a service, IaaS, you're buying the building blocks of IT, the lowest levels, hardware and software that just runs, just like what a server at Best Buy. If you need more help, if you're a small business or a medium-sized business, the cloud companies will sell you another layer on top of your infrastructure, and that's known as platform as a service, PaaS. All platform says is you need a security tool, here we have one. You need a programming tool, here we have one. You need an AI tool, here we have one. And so you literally pick off a menu of things you want to buy and pay for. And if you want to get security tools from Amazon or Microsoft or Google, they'll gladly sell them to you. If you choose to roll your own, to build your own stuff, then you bear some of the responsibility. But if you're a business of any size, ask yourself, what should I do myself? What should I outsource to the cloud company? And what should I give to a third party company that might be between me and the cloud? Which Bob is no different than how we've run IT for the last 50 years. What do I want to do myself? What do I want to outsource to a vendor? And what do I want to put a consultant or middle person in there for? And that the cloud doesn't change that. It's the same conversation with different bits, different nomenclature. So Wayne, um, just one other point about this. Uh, I think one of the big arguments that the major cloud providers at any layer of the stack, as you have, uh, you just laid them out there, one of the points they're making to their customers is, you know, they're they're saying with the greatest respect to you, our customers, and the efforts you've put into cybersecurity, we as a you know multi-billion-dollar tech company have more resources to apply to these things. And that's used as an argument for why some of the big tech companies should be able to run cloud cybersecurity more effectively than a retailer does or a healthcare company does or a pharmaceutical company. Now that doesn't mean that's true in all cases, but again, do you feel that that is an argument that should carry weight with a CEO or a board? Oh, by all means. The cloud companies are spending in the tens of billions of dollars a year collectively on cybersecurity. The capabilities they're putting in to manage at scale, to manage millions or hundreds of millions or billions of devices is something that even the largest companies can't really replicate. Uh, you know, when you're at Capital One size, major banks, major insurance companies, they spend nine figures or 10 figures on IT. So in theory, they can build exactly what they want. But for most of the people listening to this uh, video uh, conversation, they can't and they shouldn't. Nobody should spend enormous sums of money on cybersecurity when you can buy pre-configured solutions for many or most of the, the standard problems we face. There are always gonna be exceptions. I'm doing certain kinds of very high security work. I'm doing high bandwidth work. I'm doing hard real time. So I don't wanna say one size fits all. But when I look to a cloud provider, the question is, do I want to buy the commodity, the infrastructure layer, or do I want to be taking advantage of their platform? So if I go to Microsoft or I go to Amazon or I go to Google, I want to engage them at the level of what is your basic security? What is your basic identity and access management? What is your basic, there's all sorts of security acronyms and I can run through a bunch of them, but it's irrelevant. How do we look for, well, first of all, how do we prevent a threat? How do we keep it out? That's number one. Number two, how do we detect it when it's happened? There's a thing called dwell time. How long does an average virus or piece of malware live on your network before you catch it? So the first line of defense is don't let them in. 
The second line of defense is when something weird happens, an anomalous event or a series of related anomalous events, when do you start flashing the alerts? And everybody said, by the way, Capital One did a terrific job. As soon as they noticed these discrepancies, they were already starting to look for what's wrong here. And so an AI might have looked, and then a human being might have looked. And so it didn't take them very long, I think, to figure out the problem. But they'd already been penetrated, and the horse was out of the barn. So if you go to the cloud companies, you can buy threat prevention. You can buy threat detection. You can buy endpoint tools. You can buy a thing called security event management that says, if it's Tuesday, and you're coming from Belgium, and you're doing that, that doesn't look right. But if it's Thursday and you're coming from Paris, that's pretty normal. And that's the kind of things we have to look at in our networks. We have to be correlating events, some of which may be physical. Somebody is at a spot, a physical office or a location. Uh, an event happens that some physical thing happens to your company and then a digital thing happens. And so we've got to start putting these together and looking for patterns. It's like the old beat cop. They would walk the neighborhood and they would kind of look around and say, everything's quiet around here. And then we got away from that, and now it was kind of, we're going to add, look at the data or wait for people to call us. And so a lot of the tools in cybersecurity are, I, hate to, I just thought of this as we're talking, the beat cop who knows the neighborhood. And when something looks funny, they may not jump into action, but they're going to start looking around a little harder. Why is this look funny? Why is this in a different place? Why is it, it looks like it should look in the middle of the night, but it's the middle of the afternoon. And that's yeah. what we can get. So Wayne, that, those are great points there. And uh, let me shift this over a little bit to uh, money. Uh, they come to you and they say, Wayne, you've seen the budget. Are we spending enough on cybersecurity? And I know this varies company to company, but in your general experience, do you find that when it comes to cybersecurity, that budget is the issue? Budget is always an issue, clearly. And whatever you're spending on cybersecurity, I'm going to put on my CISO, Chief Information Security Officer, hat for a moment. The answer is always no. Because quite bluntly, if the board asks, they're worried. And so there's always an opportunity to get some more money out of them. But that's not the smartest path. That's not the smartest way to approach it. So we start with the whole question of what is cybersecurity? It's a form of risk. And so there's well understood risk analysis that starts with a process has an inherent risk. If we do nothing, this is what we might lose. And by the way, inherent risk is measured by severity times frequency. So what's the chance of a loss? What's the odds of an earthquake hitting California? What's the odds of a hurricane hitting Houston, Texas? And then we multiply that by the expected damage. What are we going to lose if the event happens? So an extremely unlikely event with a very high magnitude might have a reasonable risk, the 500-year earthquake or hurricane. Now, then you apply a risk mitigation. I've got my inherent risk. I then spend some money to make it less. I put in a disaster backup. I put in a security system, whatever it may be. I put a fence around my warehouse. And then I have what's known as residual risk. That's the risk that's left after I spend time on the security guard or the fence or the door lock. And then we go to the board and the board should be asked this question. Is this residual risk acceptable to the board? And, and by the way, one of the factors in risk is insurance. This, there may be a risk that an event occurs. So a thing happened. The truck got stolen out of your warehouse. So you buy insurance and that may be good enough. Now, if you're dealing with personally identifiable information, if you're dealing with HIPAA, if you're dealing with Sarbanes-Oxley failures where there are significant public relations, public policy, or audit issues, the risk may be very high. But normally you would, you would assign a numerical risk number and the board should be very good at saying, if the risk is X to start, a million dollar risk, and you want to spend $100,000 to reduce that to half a million, and we can insure and indemnify that half million, that's a rational investment. But if the risk is a million and you tell me to take it to zero costs four million, that's a dumb investment. And unless there's a mitigating circumstance, some other reason you'd want to do it non-financially, the economics should rule. So if I'm going to a board, the question I'd always ask them is, what are you comfortable with? What is the implications of different types of risk? Again, if a process fails and I lose production, I've lost some, some product in my pipeline. That's one thing. If I lose reputation with my consumers, if I'm on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, that's a very different kind of risk. And so you've got to go to the board and say, here are the types of risk. 
and then here are the risks we see in IT or that IT contributes to, and then bring them a mitigation strategy that makes economic and other kinds of sense. And that's true whether you're building a chemical plant, a uh, trucking fleet, or cybersecurity. It's the same kind of question. It turns into the same thing. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense, Wayne. And let, let me go back here as we close. One thing, I, I, you've, you've touched on this in some of our earlier discussions, but it, it's such a good point. Could you just come back to this? And that's your issue. You can outsource your hardware, you can outsource your software, don't outsource your brains. So when you have to come in and give a board of directors or a CEO some, you know, not tough talk, but blunt talk about what's going on here, the responsibilities of your company, even if you do these sorts of things in the cloud or elsewhere, you move some things here, there, you still can't just sort of sit back and play dumb and say, well, everything's covered, right? The responsibilities in the digital economy that we live in today, all these endpoints want, want to be closer and more connected to your customers. That's going to require you as the business to do more things, right? So how do you advise people don't outsource your brains? Well, I think there's a couple of factors there. And you know I, I'm a broken record about this. I think boards lack a qualified technology expert in many cases. And to clarify, Sarbanes-Oxley mandated a QFE, a qualified financial expert, after Enron and WorldCom proved that some boards didn't have the level of financial acumen needed to control their risk. And now, fast forward 18 years, I think boards are starting to need, and some are well past needing, a qualified technology expert. Somebody who is not the digital specialist who could design a new product, but who's lived through a disaster planning exercise, who's lived through a virus exercise, who's also lived through the opportunities of what can digitization bring us. So that's, that's one part of it. It's got to start at the board because as IT move from back room to center stage, they're becoming board level issues. The technology is becoming embedded in our product and the augmented product we sell, the customer experience, which is becoming more and more important, is a combination of physical and digital. And, and I want to say something about physical and digital because it ties to this risk. I read an article this morning about somebody's found a way to hack headphones. They can hack a headphone and make them very loud and even melt the speakers in the headphones. So at first I laughed and said, well, just take them off. If somebody hacks your headphone, take it off. But then you think about the general problem. What if somebody, what if we all had smart toaster ovens? And somebody could command every toaster oven in America to go to 550 degrees and stay there while you were at work. How many house fires might that cause? There was a, a James Bond movie when I was a kid. They locked him in a steam cabinet and turned up the steam, and he had to get out. So what's the digital equivalent of that? What if we turned up everybody's thermostat to 100 degrees during the middle of a heat wave? How many pets would we kill? How many wires would we catch fire? Um, how many people who are infirm and elderly would be affected negatively? So as we start connecting the physical world and the digital world, boards and CEOs and C-suite executives have got to start thinking that cybersecurity risk is not, they changed the number on my spreadsheet. It's they made all my trucks crash into the wall or they made all my forklifts drive off the end of the loading dock. Issues we never had to deal with before. So you've got to really have that knowledge and understanding of what is digital doing to my business process for good and for evil and be able to manage the opportunity and the risk. Yeah, Wayne, that, that's a, a great way to put it. And we know that sort of uh, those dogs are, are out of the cages now, right? The digital dogs, I mean, we're, we're never gonna go back. These things are with us and that, that interface, that unification of the digital, digital and physical worlds can bring great benefit, but also some problems. So uh, Wayne, thanks as always. You know, this is terrific stuff, very helpful. Um, Thank you very much for this. Always a pleasure. We'll see you next month on Saden on Digital. Thank you so much, Bob. And I do want to say to everybody watching, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you'd like to argue about something, by all means, let me know, let Bob know, and let's carry the conversation on between these monthly installments. Thanks, Wayne. Good point. And for all of you folks out there who are going to help push those conversations forward, thanks for joining us on Cloud Wars Live. We look forward to seeing you next time and next month with Wayne Saden on digital.